welcome back to 33 Founders. Chase and I are so excited to be joined with the founder of Rebel Mouse, Paul Berry. Welcome back, Paul. Thank you. So great to be with you guys again. It's been a really special year for Rebel Mouse, and amidst numerous awards and company achievements, your vision for the company has really been actualized. And I want to start out with an insight you shared from Jonah Peretti. And that's that the best companies are a direct reflection of their founders. You're really one of the most authentic people I know, Paul. What's essential for people to know to understand you? Um, well, I think that uh, I, it depends on, um, you know, I, I advise companies in New York, so that's a sort of a different relationship than, say, joining the team and working at Rebel Mouse or being a board member or advisor. Um, but I think that what's important um, to me is that uh, I, I think I'm a, I, which, the thing that I value most is not ideas that come from myself, but facilitating the types of brainstorms and conversations that lead to ideas that everyone can be really excited about. So um, for me, I, uh, I really dislike environments where people care where the idea came from, like whose idea it was, um, because it's so much more fun when it's this free flow. And uh, I think ideas live in the ether, and so they're kind of discovered and rediscovered by people anyway. And so it's the actual iteration of that process. So. I think that the, I've been thinking lately because it's interesting so, as you scale as a company and as you add senior management, uh, there's an element of brainstorms that maybe are too wide. And, um, and so I've been thinking about that a lot because I think in the, re in the best cases, uh, I think there's, there's like a spectrum that you can have as a group around conversation that's just ideas. And then you need to have, and that spectrum I think should be very wide because that's what makes things very fun. Um, and uh, to emphasize this in a, in a much simpler way, and back to Jonah, one thing I love that I learned from Jonah Peretti uh, which I think he, uh, he got a bit from his sister, who's Chelsea Peretti, who's a really now very successful comedian. She's on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. But the rules of improv are that you never say no when someone has an idea, that you're always building on top of it. So instead of no but, there's a yes and version. Um, and so I think that that's what a, a lot of people enjoy at Rebel Mouse and in working with me is this wide spectrum of uh, conversation but that then, that's all, that all can be very frustrating, actually, if it's, yeah, let's have a great brainstorm and, and nothing ever happens. So there needs to be a very narrow spectrum that's taken from that of the things we are going to do. And so if that mix of allowing all those ideas and then narrowly fitting in the things so that there's a real feeling of progress uh, and when it works best, the feeling is of all that wide spectrum, the best things, the core things, are making them set their way into the roadmap. So I, I think if you asked me that question on any day, I'd probably answer totally differently. And I don't know <laughs> if that's at all what you meant. Uh, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so then moving on to the Rebel Mouse platform, um, you strongly emphasize the importance of companies having a, uh, a voice and uniquely engaging with their users. Um, fortunately, Rebel Mouse puts them in the driver's seat to do that. So what do you believe is the most compelling trait of a brand's narrative? Well, I think that it's even, I thought last year was so exciting and this year where the industry is moving uh, is even more exciting because um, I have a sort of like overly simplistic way of, of thinking about this, which is that brands used to have, and they still have it, they have a slogan, right? So like, and they'll have campaign slogans too. And so 
Uh, we're working with GE uh, right now, and this is uh, not a done project, so I don't want to uh, pretend that this is launched, but it's just easy to talk about is they have an awesome uh, slogan of brilliant machines for one of their things. And where we're going is that you turn that slogan into the North Star for your content strategy or uh, put in newsroom terms, that's your editorial guideline. You know, that's what you're going to try to do. So, um, so we're seeing so much creativity come out of, it's funny, when I was in undergrad, it was like 96, and I thought about how many talented kids I was meeting as a freshman in NYU, and, uh, and then a lot of them in business school stuff as well. And I realized that with this, um, with this explosion of people who are creative, that companies are going to start to have incredible ads. And I pictured that back in the day like a really good TV ad, like, you know, when Apple hits it with the Eminem song in the shadow and you're just like, this is amazing. Um, but I think that the, what we're seeing now is that they're actually able to put together publications and be a media company and it's the stuff they've been talking about brands as publishers for a long time uh, but we're really excited with Rebel Moss as a platform to be able to start really uh, putting that together for brands. Aside from that example can you give us a couple of Rebel Mouse pages that you feel are really achieving that? Well, the, the one that uh, is by far the best example, uh, we're going to be launching stuff tomorrow and through next week um, that reflects um, the stuff we've done on, there's a, there's a new media company called The Dodo. Uh, Questions about that. <laughs> So the dodo.com is the site, and it's about the plight of animals. So it's not meant to be like 12 pugs in a Yoda costume. It's actually about like serious issues. Uh, there are occasionally cute or heartwarming stories, but they tend to show how there's much more to an animal. Like they're really like how intelligent they are and, and clever. Um, but so it's been an amazing uh, way to test the new product that we're launching because they used, you know, up to the Dodo, we're occasionally we're powering full sites, but, um, but this takes it really to the next level. So um, easy ones to see where we curate stuff in a beautiful way is like SamsungFrontRow.com, which Samsung did really cool stuff with Coachella on. But the Dodo is a really powerful story because they didn't have to spend time on tech, on product, on design, on that entire, there's like sysadmin scaling, mail deliver deliverability, you know, site maps. It's, it's crazy how there's like 75 things you have to do well uh, to launch a great site uh, on a product level. And really what we're trying to do is make that so simple that you can focus on your content, on your editorial voice, and on engaging with your community. So the Dodo in month one uh, from, launch, from launch hit a million uniques. And uh, three months later, they're now at seven and a half million uniques. And uh, a perfect way to illustrate how the platform is so optimized in our tuning that we're constantly doing for them and with them is a particular article page, uh, an article, it was about, they had spotted an orca that was like over 100 years old, um, and the dodo has a recurring theme and, uh, and a beat on SeaWorld and marine parks, um, and so SeaWorld says that orcas actually only live to be 25 years old, but they spotted a 100-year-old orca, so... They put together a beautiful post that in included a list format, um, a great photo. It was perfect in all devices, and it had a social call to action, which is something we built in, which you can do fun and whimsical ones like a wave for I'm Team Brazil uh, or a face-off, Team Brazil versus Team USA. Um, and there's other, a lot of other calls to action, but they used a boycott SeaWorld uh, action. So that article got 950,000 likes on Facebook, uh, and it got 5 million page views. 
Uh, but more importantly, it generated 100,000 signatures on that petition, which includes a lightweight join. So that, may, that got the Dodo an additional 80,000 newsletter subscribers. Um, and on top of it, after you sign it, you're asked, we have a really beautiful content creation tool, which is really important to us. Like you can write really uh, easily and it's a beautiful tool. So they're asked to write, why do they care about the issue? So of the 100,000 who signed the petition, they got 100 new blog posts that were really great, five of which did over 50,000 pages each. And so that's kind of like what we're doing for clients, is that whole helping with their editorial voice to deliver a product that gives them viral potential. And the fun thing, yeah, so, and when you become the destination that Facebook and all this traffic is pointing at, uh, the way we are, then we're able to totally optimize and tune to exactly what we're seeing and then give really great feedback to the clients. Uh, but, um, so, you know, there's a metaphor that, uh, that people are talking about that um, launching a media company whose goal is to reach audience right now done right is like people uh, launching cable channels in the 80s. We're basically so able to reach this audience. And the infrastructure is there with how Facebook can send traffic and Google and Twitter and all of it combined and how to build a community. The missing piece, we believe, is what we're doing with Rebel Mouse to just be able to have this beautiful site uh, that you can launch quickly. And so when we spoke last time in July, you were telling us that uh, one of your biggest goals was to increase revenue. Is uh, what you were yep. just touching on, was that part of one of your initiatives? Or what, what are the biggest strides that you've taken to accomplish that? Yeah, so on one side, there's just the pure, like as, a, uh, as advice to other founders, there's a lot of organizational stuff you have to do. Um, the... The months of winter, in some ways, like we had three or three to five months where we were transitioning a lot of clients that were using us for our free versions, moving them to the enterprise paid one. It's a struggle. It's hard internally. It's hard for people. They just want to support their friends in the other companies, uh, and we and it takes communication to the other companies. But it, it's been very important for us. Uh, to do, and we've hired really fantastic sales and strategy people to support that, and we've doubled the product design and dev team. And what it's given us is uh, what I believe is a re really deep product that answers how you how you create participation and how content can turn into community and signups. Uh, and I think that um, having the push to be something that would be really valuable to companies enough that they pay us recurring monthly SaaS uh, revenue for it um, has been a very good focus for us all uh, as a company. Awesome. And now this next question, I think it might be kind of relevant actually, but I want to touch on Lear Ventures for a little bit. Um, yeah. I have a buddy actually who works with Ashish from EIR. Um, and he was telling me just how interesting it is, uh, the way that they work with some of the other startups and how everyone helps each other. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the interactions between companies and the portfolio and what LV does to match them up? Yeah, so I think um, it's been really like I work with Eric Kepo and Ken Lair at HuffPost so much and a lot of the partners there. So it's been really amazing to see how quickly they've become the center of the scene for startups in New York. Uh, Eric and Ken are very different personalities, like radically, like yin and yang, completely different. Uh, and they have so much, um, well, like I can tell you, like Kenny is just incredibly good at, he's so intuitive. And he thinks about where companies need to get in order to have buzz not how to get them buzzed from where they are, but where they should get. And he's unlike anybody else I've ever seen at thinking about positioning and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, Eric is good at that too, but he it helps with scale so well. I mean, how, how deals are put together as well. Uh, he's he's in unusually good at finding that honest, fair line in a deal where both parties 
are happy with the whole thing years later. Um, and they're, they're both very good at a couple things. One is keeping really great talent in the family. And that sort of in the family thing matters a lot. If, if someone is in a really talented in one of the portfolio companies and they, the portfolio company pretending, let's say they had to pivot and they're now a very different company from what that employee signed up for, but they're really like they're either an amazing salesperson or they're an amazing developer. Um, everybody really believes that the sort of not just, um, I think, that Eric and Ken are really honest, decent people that are really fair, so you can go and talk to them about it, and they're not going to, like, have temper tantrums or flip out. They're going to, like, be very human in a, in a very constructive way. And that, um, you know, for the most part by far, they, they work with other people who are also very decent. So, you know, when we go, when, I, when they have the Lear Venture Summit, which is all the CEOs of the portfolio companies go to the um, Met Stadium uh, for a day, it's so awesome seeing the other founders. Like, they pick such, some of them are total oddballs, total weirdos, but like, and some are straight, like, impressive business uh, uh, women and men, but it's a, it's a very decent group, group of people. And that, uh, that is really important because then there's this feeling of this network of trust. So you don't have to worry that there's like all these jerks playing political games with each other. They also don't force things at all. Some often startup companies, to be honest, they're not at the stage to work with another startup. Trying to partner at those stages can actually be very confusing. So one of the things that Lear Ventures is best at is connecting to, to the large companies that you do need to work with because they might pay you or they might put you in high traffic. Um, and usually the startups that you talk with, it's like trading notes in life usually that is so useful. It's like, uh, so I think that for me has been the experience anyway. But they're very good at listening. They are not overbearing. So they don't push help that's unrequested. But people who know, the founders who know how to use them and request help from them all agree that, oh my God, it's been so valuable. And I know something that all of you guys have been working on together, Paul, is the Dodo. I know Ken's daughter, Izzy, runs that and she's finishing up at Columbia. So it's, it's great to see everybody come together with that. And Ken said, you know, everyone wants Paul Berry to run their site. And we definitely want Paul Berry to run our site, but let's say a lucky content startup won an afternoon of advising from you. How would you advise them to scale their business? Um, well, we believe with the product that we're running, we're rolling out now that we do have the right solution for media companies to begin on. So it's not just for existing brands. And the Dodo has been this, uh, awesome lab where we get to experiment free of um, contracts that and like client needs and like account management and just be able to be really fast about building the best product for editorial. And we really feel that we're there for this, uh, the, the first version of that product to be incredibly useful. Uh, I, and in part for launching uh, new media companies. So. Um, I think that the big question right now that you should you have to ask yourself as advice to another founder is are you building something that the core of the value you're building is the technology then you have to find developers and you have to put your team together and you need the right capital because it's all very expensive to be able to really support a team of developers um, to build something really great um, but uh, you know, if you take a Vice, for example, their tech was extremely low and barely there at all, and they really just focused on these concepts of like, well, let's send a hipster to the wilderness to see the guy who lives with the grizzly bear, and let's have North Face pay for that. And it's so smart. So I love that, and I think that it's a, it's a really fun 
the next five years, we're going to see some amazing stories of people who just had an idea and, and blew it out to be something that they had suddenly this huge audience around. Uh, and I think the trend is like we've seen it, that it's costing less and less money to launch those. And if what we're doing works, it will cost even less money to be able to launch these. But at the same time, uh, take all the pain of scaling that because right now, People who find themselves with a viral hit usually have the architecture for a little playground they were playing with. So then they get their big moment and they don't have the capacity to handle that, which is just so painful because those are the moments you grow the most. Awesome. And now uh, I, I kind of want to touch more on the dodo. Just everything that you're saying was so interesting about that. So um, regarding the dodo and Rebel Mouse 2.0, can you uh, tell us how this iteration really is so different and when users can expect it for a... Uh, the platform as a whole? Yeah, so um, the, the difference is that we took a really, a, a very deep dive at what would, what would be the very elegant solution for uh, launching a full-blown site. Um, so it leverages, I love it because all the technology we had developed up to now was necessary for this. So for example, if you want to launch a new section, like a video page, or for the Dodo, maybe they want to launch something about marine parks, all the content that they've been writing and ingesting and getting from users, and it's this mix of curation plus original content, is tagged, so it's super easy to on-the-fly launch a section. So that means that if you're a brand, Rebel Mouse, you can think of as a launch pad for all your campaigns. Um, and each hashtag that you think of is just a new section that you launch and start to create content around and have users create more and be inclusive, etc. Um, before this, you could do that, but each time you had a new idea, you kind of had to launch a new page on your own CMS and embed this new thing. And now by setting it up once, you can use this constantly always on, uh, launching new pages, new sections. Uh, so that's, not, that's the like, important piece uh, overall. But uh, along with that, uh, there's a lot of features in it. So the, new, the entry editor, like how you write content, we put a lot of time into it. There's some really beautiful things. Like if you write a headline, then we go and search uh, off of that headline and return images for you right away. So you don't even have to go look for other images. And that includes a Giphy inter in uh, integration, Jiffy or Giphy, I, I won't get into battle. But uh, so it's, you have these amazing, awesome posts, and then the creator, the entry creation tool, so easy to just add a link for, to a tweet, and then that expands to the the embedded tweet or the same with YouTube or a link to an article, we'll go grab the thumbnail. Uh, so we really think it's a it's a the best place to start your original content now, which it wasn't before this. But the article page is also incredibly optimized now for recirculation. So we want to fight the bounce rates that people get from just I came from Facebook and left. Uh, and then there's all of these calls to action that we have uh, integrated, and when those are probably the most powerful thing. Um, there's a lot of this around, there's a lot of talk right now in the last couple of weeks uh, because a couple media companies, uh, including Huffington Post, which I won't talk about that, dropping their comment section to build community. And I think uh, to do that right, though, you need the types of tools that we have that actually really ask them to participate as center stage and not as bottom below the gutter. So, um, so the on top of it, we have a new layer of stats, and so also the front page management is really cool because along with launching a new section, which is now on your nav, you can go and with a couple clicks modify your right column. So you might have like let's say that um, you're doing, I'm just going to pick uh, an example, but let's say you're doing the Olympics and then you realize like the, that you don't have a section for ice skating, you could on the fly create, create that section and then add a zone on your front page in the right column that has the two most popular stories 
from ice skating right now. And it's like literally the site updates in that moment. You don't have to have developers saying, oh, add that module, take that module down, etc. So, um, so I'm really excited about how it all comes together uh, to be this, uh, to be really optimized to be able to let people launch communities. Yeah, and word on the street is that while uh, the Dota was in beta, the sole contributors were uh, actually the inhabitants of Dog Island. Can you confirm or deny <laughs> this rumor? <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's so funny. Really, the Dog Island is going to have to launch a Rebel Mouse site where, like, oh all these gosh. things <laughs> is created over what the dogs are doing. I, 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 I have thought about bringing the two together. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I think one of my favorite parts was uh, the CD, the nature sounds on the island. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, that was fun. Paul, I want to close with a quote that I found on your dad's blog, which stated, I remember a great quote from Paul Berry, which went something like this. Let's have an idea on Monday. Instead of having lots of meetings about that idea, let's just do that effing idea. By Wednesday, we'll have realized the flaw and iterated. And by Friday, it's either executed or almost done. I know that the meaning behind the name Rebel Mouse is an underdog that you can root for. How does the underdog's mentality translate into your work? Oh, uh, yeah, I love that question because it's totally part of our culture uh, that the way that we're doing our development, the way we're organized, uh, gives us this really guerrilla advantage over massive companies with huge bureaucracies and structures. So you can look at someone with like, 2,000 developers and they can go significantly slower uh, than us. So I love that that's embedded in the culture. It's sort of a group that uh, proved it at scale at HuffPost. So that makes the people who are like new to it, which it is a fairly different culture if you're joining as a developer, the way things work and go live and that you realize that, oh, okay, so, you know, if you're a Python developer in Europe, that you're paired with an amazing Python developer in Sri Lanka, so that when the time zone passes, they take it on, and at first, you might be like, I don't know, is that guy good, and then you realize he's brilliant, and you're learning all this stuff from him, and so I think that uh, is something that um, we are going to work very hard to keep as we grow. And that's what I wanted to follow up with, Paul, when the company, so since we last spoke with you, you are, you've already added 20 more people to your team. When you're no longer in that startup phase anymore, how do you make sure that there's no paradigm shift and you keep that? Well, I've, thought, I've been thinking about this a lot, as you can imagine. Uh, there, there's a little bit of balance between all of it. I've realized that there's a lot of talk about how a founder has to keep the culture exactly how they wanted it. But I, I actually think that the, the right thing is to accept that the culture will evolve uh, and not to be a control freak about it, but instead to help it evolve in a way that you can be really proud of. So it might be different. You know, it's like I have three kids. And um, the way that they grow up, like you might have wanted them to, like my son, uh, I would like him to be a better reader. But God, he, like he's six and he's so damn good at chess and he plays all the time. They're like, all right, well, we're going to go with that. And so I think that especially as you add real partners and real senior management, that it's very important for them to be able to become a part of the culture and that the, the personality that they are, you're, you're really working with people that you can be proud of representing you. And that, and 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 once you've reached that point, that you also give them the latitude uh, to be able to have impact. Uh, and so, I think it's a little less about keeping it to the culture that it was than making sure that it's growing. It's like I think the best for me, the best management metaphors are like gardening metaphors. Because it's like people, you can kind of correlate to plants. Like some people, like some trees 
need to be in the sunlight direct, like that they will only thrive if they have that. And some, like they need to be sheltered underneath the shade of one of these, uh, et cetera. And so the way that uh, I'm watching Rebel Mouse grow up, I think of myself in a lot of ways as more of a gardener than, uh, than, than you know, that I'm directing every single piece of growth. Exactly. Wonderful. Did that answer? Or? That's Completely. perfect. And it gives us the perfect topic to touch on when we get together for our next interview to see how it goes because we're pretty confident that Rubber Moss is not going to be in the startup phase for very long. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope so. <laughs>